The Nine Hells of Beator, the plain of lawful evil, home to the insidious devils, always scheming to find new ways to damn mortals to their dominion, in order to fill their legions of hell with more soldiers to fight the eternal blood war with demons, but also in the selfish hopes of taking credit for their soul and earning a promotion. Beator is made up of nine layers, the first eight ruled by a different lord or archduke, and the ninth ruled by the ruler of hell himself, Asmodeus. So first, let's take a look at the location of the Nine Hells within the cosmology of Dungeons & Dragons. 1st edition, 2nd edition, and 5th edition all use the Great Wheel cosmology. In that one, the Nine Hells is located in the middle of the Lawful section of the Lower Plains, making it purely Lawful Evil. It is between the Lawful Evil, Lawful Neutral plane of Acheron and the Lawful Evil, Neutral Evil plane of Gehenna. 3rd edition uses the World Tree cosmology, where Beator is grouped in the Fiendish Plane category. 4th edition uses the World Axis cosmology, where, like all the Outer Planes in that one, it just kind of floats randomly in the Astral Sea. So let's look at how you get there. There are a lot of ways to get to the Nine Hells. One of them is through the Astral Plane. If you can get to the Astral Plane, whether through a portal you find, the astral projection spell, the plane ship spell, or what have you. While wandering the astral plane, you can come across color pools that take you to the first layer of different outer planes. First, third, and fifth edition, the color pool to the Nine Hells is ruby. If you can find a ruby color pool in the astral plane, it'll take you to Avernus, the first layer of the Nine Hells. In second edition, it makes a point to say that even though some people think color pools are color-coded, different colors going to different planes, that that's not true, and that the color means nothing, and that they're truly just random. However, it does point out that you can look into the pool without actually entering it, and you can see what's on the other side, so that you can kind of have an idea of what plane you're going to. Avernus is going to look drastically different than, let's say, the first layer of Carcery. In 4th edition, the pool was a roiling cloud of red smoke, so basically keeping the same thing as 1st, 3rd, and 5th, where there is a specific color to a specific plane, and a cloud of red smoke is pretty similar to ruby, so it's essentially the same, but I figured I'd point out the descriptive differences in the 4th edition Manual of the Planes. Now, in addition to the color pools in the Astral Plane, in 2nd uh, edition, in the Planescape campaign setting, uh, there was something called Astral Conduits that could get you to planes, however, you couldn't actually add access them while in the astral. You had to find the entrance to one in the prime material plane, and then it would take you through the astral plane, and it would drop you off on the first layer of a plane. So that was also another way to get there. Another way is in the City of Doors, also known as Sigil, uh, which is in the center of the Outlands. Some say it's the center of the multiverse itself, or at least the center of the outer planes. In this, there are doors or portals or gates or whatever you want to call them. And they're not obvious. They don't glow or anything unless you have, uh, I think, True Sight that lets you see that. But it doesn't, even that doesn't tell you where they lead. So you have to know the location of a portal. You have to hopefully know where it leads. It might not lead where you want it to go. And then in addition for it to work, you have to have a special key. And then assuming all of that, you can arrive on an outer plane or at any plane, not just an outer plane. And you can arrive in any layer of a plane. Uh, you were not forced to go to the first layer of a plane. This is the only way to skip layers. The location of most portals to the Nine Hells tends to vary in cunning pattern, moving from one location to another, a reflection of the twisted logic of the Batizu. The known fixed portals to Beator are always heavily guarded, because the Nine Hells is in the middle of a war with the demons, so they don't want just anyone coming and going. All of that information I said is from the Planescape campaign setting from 2nd edition, however Sigil and its doors are all canon and talked about in every edition except 1st. There is another portal that can get you to Beator, and it is found in Ribcage, the gate town to the Nine Hells. Gate towns are towns that spring up around portals to the Outer Plains within the Outlands, which is the area that Sigil is located in. The portal is located in the Citadel, which is sort of like the headquarters of Ribcage, uh, and it's where the Lord, or sometimes called the Baron, lives. 
in order to get to that portal, you have to get let inside the Citadel, which normally involves doing favors for some of the higher up important people in town. Once you're in there, you then need to convince the Lord to let you in. And keep in mind, getting favors to get into the Citadel and then letting the Baron let you through the portal, none of this is going to be free. You will probably be spending around 500 to 2,000 gold pieces to get all this done and possibly doing a favor or two here and there. And when I say let you through the portal, I mean giving you a pass. A pass in the form of an official invitation, but official invitation is in quotation marks. Lesser devils respect the invitation, afraid of the supposed power, and greater Batizu find it amusing, waiting for the moment those involved are discovered by one of the Lords of the Nine. So for the most part, this works to get in, and most devils aren't going to bother you for it, but if you show this forged invitation to, let's say, you know, Dispater, Lord of Dis, you might find yourself in trouble. The portal itself involves climbing up a 12-foot wall with a rope and then crawling through a small gap at the top of the ceiling that's glowing red. In order for the portal to work, you need the correct key, which is a lit flame. In addition to the Outlands Gate Town of Ribcage, you can also use uh, spells to get here via an Astral Projection spell, which still requires you to find a color pool as if traveling the Astral normally, uh, the Plane Shift spell, in which case you need an Iron Tune fork tuned to f sharp that'll put you at the first layer of the nine hells avernus um you can also use a major chord of f sharp to get you to the second layer of dis or you can use a minor chord of f sharp to get you to the third layer of mineros and then obviously magic items that duplicate these spells can get you there like a cubic gate or something technically you can use a gate spell as well without needing a precise tuning fork you can just say nine hells and it should get you there but powers on the plane you're opening a gate on can choose to not allow it and since hell is at constant fear of demon armies marching in and they are a lawful plane with strict rules i kind of doubt asmodeus or any of the lords would allow that now let's look at the origin of Beator. Where did it come from? Well, there's several stories, and most of them are related to the origin of Asmodeus. Asmodeus has multiple different origin stories, and that kind of changes the origin of Beator depending on which one. I'm not going to go too in-depth on Asmodeus' origin. I can do that on a separate video, and this video is not really for that. Also, Mr. Rex already did an amazing video on the origin stories of Asmodeus, so I don't really feel a need to make one. If you're curious about it, you should go check it out. It's really, really well put together and interesting. But I will give you context when needed in order to understand where Beator originated from. So, second edition in the book Guide to Hell, it lists Asmodeus' origin story of the twin world serpents and he is one of them named Ariman. in that story all the outer planes and the outlands were formed in the beginning of the universe so beator has kind of always been around however it was not populated by devils until Ariman fell into beator his blood sprayed across the plane and from those drops sprang the batizu also known as the devils however in another second edition book called faces of evil the fiends on page 12 it talks about an ancient race of powerful unknown creatures that inhabited Beator before the first devil ever existed. So there was something here before Ariman fell into Beator. There was a race of things here, and eventually they stopped existing, I assume because they were wiped out by the Batizu. But I just think that's interesting that they reference that, but they never really talk about it again or explain it. However, the origin story of Beator for 4th edition it sort of is reminiscent of this. In 3rd edition, in the book Fiendish Codex 2, Tyrants of Hell, Asmodeus was originally an angel created by the gods of law to combat the demons and their chaos so that the gods could move on to other projects such as creating worlds and mortals. When mortals who had free will did not follow the edicts of their gods, Asmodeus invented punishment, a way to encourage them to follow the law. However, this punishment was being done within the realms of the gods in the upper planes, because at that time that's where all souls went. The gods could not stand to hear the screams of torment in their domain, so Asmodeus agreed to create a hell, pointing to a barren land that would become Beator. So in this story, Beator, or the land that was Beator had always existed, but it was barren and not populated or used for anything until Asmodeus moved there, which would have been sometime after the material plane existed and after mortals had been created. So there would have been a time period where mortals existed and hell didn't exist, which is, you know, obviously different than it always existing. In 4th edition, Beator used to be a celestial realm called Baytheon, ruled by He Who Was. 
uh, because his name was unknown. Asmodeus was an archangel of his who rose to the power of Exarch. Eventually, Asmodeus was corrupted by the demon lord Pazuzu, went into the heart of the Abyss, and stole a fraction of the Shard of Pure Evil, which is the thing that created the Abyss. Asmodeus was punished for this, but he was not killed. He was left broken in mind and body with his followers on the edge of the domain of Baytheon by he who was, and he was hoping he would regret his disobedience and pride. Obviously, this didn't work, and Asmodeus waited during a crucial point when the gods were losing the Dawn War, and he rebelled, turning the shard into the ruby rod, and he slayed the deity he who was. As the god died, he cursed him, turning the angels into devils and the verdant beautiful land of Baytheon into the scorched wasteland of Beator. The information for this is sort of spread out across 4th edition from a lot of different sources and random books. Uh, I didn't bother going through all of them, I just let the Forgotten Realms wiki do that information for me, so you can check that out for the sources. Now, it says he that it used to be a celestial realm that was ruled by a god, implying it used to be an upper plane, maybe? But it's also in the shape of a planet in 4th edition? which sort of makes it seem like it might have been a prime material world that was then dragged to the Outer Plains when Asmodeus corrupted it, but the lore is very vague, there's not really any details, and who really knows? In 5th edition, in the book Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, it has the same Asmodeus origin story that 3rd edition uses, the Pact Primeval. However, this version is less detailed and doesn't actually explain how Hell was originally formed. Now, you could extrapolate and assume it's the same version as 3rd edition, since it's using the same Asmodeus origin story as 3rd edition, where it was created by him to serve the gods. However, 5th edition also went back to the Great Wheel cosmology from 2nd edition, so that could imply that Hell, along with all 16 outer planes has been around since the creation of the universe, but it's never explicitly stated where Beator came from in 5th edition. Now let's look at the geography of the Nine Hells. In 1st edition, the layers are on top of each other, the lowest point of one being the entrance to the next, so if you went through an entrance to the next layer, you could just fall a very long distance. Uh, according to this map, they were arranged so that they only partially overlapped each other, almost like a staircase. 2nd, 3rd, and 5th edition, it's described as an inverted mountain or an inverted cone, each subsequent layer beneath the last, and each kind of getting smaller as you go down. In 4th edition, it says that Beator is a planet 7,000 miles in diameter. Now, 1st and 2nd edition says that all the outer planes are infinite, including Hell, obviously. In 3rd and 4th edition, Hell is finite. 4th edition says it's a planet 7,000 miles in diameter, and then 3rd edition specifically lists the width and miles of each layer. 5th edition... I assume it's also infinite since it's using the same cosmology as 1st and 2nd edition. However, I couldn't find any line of text in a 5th edition book that specifically said it's infinite, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works in 5e. Now, along with the geography, we have to talk about the river sticks because that's a pretty important part of any lower plane. The river Styx flows through the top layer of all the lower planes. However, tributaries of it also flow through other layers of some of the planes, and which layers it flows through changes between the additions. So in first edition, the river Styx flowed through Avernus, the first layer, obviously, and also the fifth layer of Stygia. In second edition, it flows through Avernus, Stygia, and Nessus, although it going to Nessus is a closely guarded secret, and they kill anyone who finds out about it, and they kill anyone who rides the river Styx down into Nessus. In 3rd edition, it touches Avernus, Stygia, and Nessus as well. However, it also says that the Styx flows like a waterfall from Cania, the 8th layer, down into Nessus. And you can see on this map that that's exactly what it's doing. However, it makes no mention of it flowing through Cania. But in order for it to flow from Cania to Nessus, it kind of has to, so I'm a little confused there. However, the book this information is coming from, the Phoenix Codex 2, is filled with a lot of weird contradictions like that, especially when it comes to the hierarchy, so I'll just chalk it up to that. In 4th edition, it flows through, and this is where it gets weird, it flows through Avernus, Mineros, Stygia, Malbulge, Malodomini, and Cania. The only ones it doesn't flow through are Dis, Phlegathos, and Nessus. So it flows through all of them but three. But one of the duns, the one of the ones it doesn't flow through is one of the ones it did flow through in the last two editions. So I, I don't know what they were doing there. And then in fifth edition, it flows through Avernus like usual, but one tendril of it breaks off and it flows through every layer of the Nine Hells, every single layer. No weird skipping layers here. Now let's talk about the effects of the Nine Hells. How do the laws of physics and the laws of magic work differently in the Nine Hells as opposed to the Prime Material Plane? 
Second edition, you had the Planescape campaign setting. That has a lot of very, very detailed information on how stuff works on all the different planes. So second edition has a lot of specific, uh, maybe convoluted detail on how stuff works in the Nine Hells. So since the Nine Hells is an outer plane, it does not connect to the ethereal plane and thus the inner planes. So any spell that needs those to work are not possible to cast here, such as spells that conjure elementals or create demi-planes. Also, only the first layer of the Nine Hells of Vernus touches the Astral Plane, so any spell that needs the Astral to work, such as Resurrection Magic, does not work on any layer except the first. Priests are treated as a level lower for each plane between this one and the plane their deity resides in. The Batizu don't want the order disrupted or one of their kind being controlled, so conjuration is difficult. Any summonings require a binding ritual to be completed perfectly, or else that creature will not obey the summoner. Beotor is not a happy place, so divinations always have a grim tone to the results, usually involving a fiend delivering the message, and fiends are always attracted to divination spells here, so roaming devils will end up wandering up to you shortly after casting them. Those that live in the Nine Hells don't care for beneficial magic, so necromancy spells that give life or heal don't work well. The caster must make a save versus spell, or the spell fails. Necromantic spells that cause damage or pain, or control undead, perform exceptionally well. They are actually cast as if the spell slinger were one level higher. Given the lawful nature of the plane, wild magic is diminished, so all wild mages are reduced one level per layer while here, and all wild magic spells of 4th level or higher simply fail. Elemental magic varies, on Stiggy or Arcania, the layers of ice, water magic is intensified, and fire magic is impossible without a spell key. Phlegathos makes it difficult to cast water-based magic, Avernus is good for fire and earth, Cania works for air and water, etc. You can bypass most of these restrictions with the right spell keys, which was a thing in Planescape. In Avernus, all spells need the same key, a chunk of obsidian from the River of Blood that flows through the explosive plane. Each layer requires progressively more keys, 3 for Dis, 9 for the third, 27 for the next, 81 for the one after, and so on as a traveler descends down the pit, until by Nessus, the final layer, it almost seems that every spell requires a specific key. Keys of the first three layers almost never change, those of the next three change every hundred years or so, and the last three layers switch constantly with no apparent rhyme or reason. But there is a pattern, one that only the twisted minds of the devils that live there could understand. So that's all for 2nd edition. For 3rd edition, according to the manual of the planes, magic is normal except where Phlegathos has the fire dominant trait and Kania has the cold dominant trait. Also, chaotic characters and good characters suffer minus 2 to all charisma based checks. Therefore, chaotic good characters suffer a minus 4 to all charisma based checks. In 4th edition and their manual of the planes, this is the one that I think is probably the most boring. I mean, 3rd edition is pretty boring too, but 4th edition I think is the most boring way of handling this. Stiggy on Cania, cold attacks get plus one to hit and fire damage is halved. Avernus Dis, Phlegathos, and Nessus get plus one to fire attacks and cold damage is halved. And then while on Mineros or Maladomini, you get plus one to poison and disease attacks and healing is halved. And then in 5th edition, in the Dungeon Master's Guide, page 64, at the end of each long rest, a visitor that isn't evil must make a DC-10 wisdom saving throw. On a fail, creature's alignment changes to lawful evil. The change is permanent if a creature doesn't leave the Nine Hells within 1d4 days. Otherwise, their alignment reverts to normal after one day spent on another plane. Casting the Dispel Evil and Good Spell also reverts their alignment. That's from the Dungeon Master's Guide. Now, also within 5th edition, you have a little bit of information from Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus. Magic will be visually altered to take on a more sinister and infernal tone, but mechanically functions the same. Archdevils can eavesdrop on any telepathic communication, such as via the message or sending spell, and then a combination of Avernus' oppressive heat and supernatural malevolence weighs on the body and souls of those of non-evil alignment. A non-evil character treats travel through Avernus as a forced march, and therefore must make a DC-10 constitution saving throw every one hour of travel. The DC is 10 plus 1 for each hour of travel. On a failed saving throw, a creature suffers one level of exhaustion. Now, obviously, this is intended for Avernus, the first layer, because the campaign takes place in Avernus, and only Avernus. However, you could easily apply this to the other hot layers as well, such as Dis, Phlegathos, and Nessus, and then you could probably come up with something similar for the other layers if you really wanted to. So that is 
the lore on the Nine Hells in general throughout all the editions of Dungeons and Dragons. I will do more videos on the individual layers themselves, and I also do some videos on the devils and the inhabitants of the Nine Hells as well. So stay tuned for more.